and that is Professor Ernst Munstead. Munstead, I'm probably not saying that right. <laughs> uh, and she's a new faculty in Scandinavian studies. Um, she uh, has received her dissertation from the University of Copenhagen. She is a Danish Greenlandic trained prehistorian uh, archaeologist, but also I'd say folklorist. And uh, she got her BA, PhD, and um, sorry, BA, MA, and PhD from Copenhagen, which is a hotbed of all kinds of wonderful research. So she, she is uh, up to speed. She has worked 10 years in the National Museum of Denmark and has been on field trips in Germany, Japan, several places in Denmark, but also mainly in Greenland, where her uh, actual research has been of late, which we're going to hear about today. And as I said, she is in the uh, Scandinavian Studies Department, and she's teaching a course called Arctic Folklore and Myth Mythology in Nordic Lands this term, which is wonderful, a wonderful combination. And so we are really thrilled to introduce her and have her today. And she is talking a very nice and clear title, Artifacts and Echoes, Potentials and Challenges in Connecting Arctic Oral Testimonies. So please... Um, Oh, and land and objects. Uh, oral testimonies to land and objects. So linking stories to objects. It'll be wonderful. So thank you very much for coming and please welcome um, Sarah. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to come here today. Um, as some of you might have noticed, I have been sneaking in here on some of the lunch <laughs> times uh, to come and hear an interesting archaeological talk. Um, and so today I'm excited to give a talk back to you guys. Um, and also, this is a chance for me to discuss some of the latest work that I have done. Um, my talk is called artifacts and echoes, and we're going to have a closer look um, at some of the potentials, but also the challenges of connecting uh, Arctic oral testimonies with some of the archeological records that we have of the country. And uh, it says here it's Arctic, but it's mainly in Greenland. And all of the stories connected uh, to this talk is from Greenland. Um, and this work here that I'm presenting is some of the works that is featured in my upcoming book with the Routledge uh, in their Arctic Worlds series. And among indigenous communities, oral traditions play a crucial role for several reasons. In pre-colonial societies, they served as a platform for sharing worldviews uh, instilling morality, building, and transmitting knowledge. Following colonization, oral traditions have ensured the preservation of the knowledge, as well as functioned as a medium for the people's own history writing and awareness, where the colonizer otherwise wrote the official history. In Greenland, oral traditions are as ancient as the Gadafid Inuit themselves, and they played a valuable role throughout generations. Stories, songs, rhymes, riddles, and chants have been alive uh, in order to remember and preserve valuable life lessons. Furthermore, some stories served as entertainment in this non-digital age. So in short, the older stories explained the Inuit worldview, while the more recent stories primarily served as allegories explaining socially acceptable behavior and of the importance of providing the youngsters with the skills needed to survive, but also thrive in the Arctic uh, environment. So stories featuring um, supernatural and scary revidut. We see one here at the bottom to the, uh, to the left. Um, for instance, they served uh, a protective role, cautioning young children against interacting with strangers and preventing them from consuming the poisonous plant called revidup essai, which means the fingers of the revidup. So when you are explained that these, this plant belongs, uh, are the fingers of this uh, 
scary creature, definitely you're not gonna eat this plant. Mm -hmm. um, and the depiction we see here of the Revit Dock uh, is an illustration made by Greenlandic born, uh, born Maya Lisa Kevitt. What we see here is the artist Gitch Johansson's illustration of Akarios Jokwa, who was the personification of landslides. Gitch Johansson's illustration has been put on top of a picture I took uh, during field work in West Greenland. And this is just to illustrate how I, with my work, aim for the Greenlandic landscape to re-emerge. Uh, as it used to be for the Greenlandic Inuit living a few hundred years ago. A way for us to learn more about the worldview embedded in the man-made structures and in the language is through intense studies of Greenlandic oral history. Through these, we may get to understand the ideas and concepts Greenlandic Inuit had of their houses, of their settlements, and of the surrounding landscape. Indeed. <laughs> when the renowned Danish Greenlandic polar explorer Knud Rasmussen embarked on the fifth Tula expedition in the early 1920s across Arctic Canada, he encountered the wise Inuk named Osaka, who among many other roles was a storyteller. Here is what Osarak uh, said to Knud about the importance of the stories Knud wished to record. He said, our stories are people's experiences and they are not always beautiful things to hear, but it is impossible to decorate a narrative so that it can be pleasant to hear when it at the same time must be true. The tongue must be the echo of the event and cannot be nudged to the mood and taste. The words of the newborn cannot be trusted, but the experiences of the old generations hold true. When I tell stories, I do not speak out of myself. Then it is the wisdom of the ancestors that speak through me. And so these tales contain the wisdom of the ancestors can be found in an online database that is called Myths and Legends. In short, the Myth and Legend database is a database that is publicly available as it is online and searchable. It exists thanks to sociologist Birgitta Sonne, who set up the database as a part of her doctoral dissertation a few years ago. The database contains 2,280 stories that all have been collected in Greenland between 1735 and 1981. The stories collected from 1735 and onwards were originally told in a local Greenlandic dialect and later translated into Danish or sometimes English. And today they exist in either full text or as longer or shorter summaries in this database. Sadly, we only encounter Greenlandic text in the title, but not always. Sometimes we see Greenlandic in a passage or where the Greenlandic text was unclear, or we encounter Greenlandic uh, with uh, Inuit individual names or place names connected to the landscape. On the illustration here to the right, we see what cities the stories were collected in or nearby in Greenland. And thereby we see that all of Greenland is represented. Um, all the red dots here are places that are inhabited. Um, people only live on the coast, uh, along the coast in Greenland. Here we see the results of the filtered search. Um, and as you can see, some keywords had many hits, whereas some uh, had only a few, while also some they have none. So here we see on the house level, different keywords connected to uh, archeological or uh, objects that we know or parts of the structures. Here we see on the settlement level uh, outside of the winter house, 
And here we find elements um, beyond that, also connected to natural features in the landscape. Here we see an example taken directly from the myth and legend database. What is highlighted here is the Danish word Rex, uh, referring to the sleeping platform. And by the text, we understand that it was customary to relocate orphan children from the main sleeping platform to a side sleeping platform by the window. So through this text here, we understand that uh, there is a social order but this order is changed when your parents die. Then you are relocated to another part of the house. If we take a look at the Nunifid database, uh, which is a database containing information on the many archeological sites in Greenland, we see all the archeological activities that have been registered in the country through all periods dating back to 2500 BC till now. So this is all of the archaeological activity in the country. If we then um, only look at the latest residing culture in the country, uh, this is what it looks like. As we then find that 2,488 winter settlements have been registered from the Tula culture or also called the Inuit culture dating from approximately 1150 AD to 1900 AD. So therefore they are the ancestors of modern Greenlanders or Kerasi. If we then first delve into um, the, how the testimonies from the Greenlandic Inuit old stories produce alternative interpretations on the house level, uh, we need to revisit Avotungyaks Island, or also called Ruin Island, in the very northern part of Greenland. Avotungyak Island that we see here, um, uh, it gives its name to the Ruin Island phase, which is situated, um, what, which is the earliest part of the Tula culture. Um, but the island itself is situated approximately uh, three kilometers ashore from Inuafisuak in northern Greenland. It is small in size, uh, measuring only 250 meters in width and rising only 12 meters above the sea level. On the northern and southern shorelines, uh, we meet uh, rows of meat catches, a single fox trap and two ten rings are local located on the western side. Um, so here we see the ten rings and we see the meat caches on the northern and on the southern side. And here we find all the winter houses. The house ruins um, can from their construction be relatively dated to one of the earliest Inuit occupations in Greenland at approximately the second half of the 1100s to 1300s. Also, the houses at Avotungiak Island can be relatively dated via finds of harpoon heads of the Tule II type with vestigial barbs and spurs. Um, and lastly, there are found some uh, dorset objects and some objects of Norse origin within these structures. Haltville's excavation uh, at Avotomir Island uh, yields intriguing discoveries, particularly in house two that we see here to the left, where the lower part of the house contains, quote, much bare hair, end quote. And the lower part of the house likely refers to the entrance tunnel that we see here. So you would crawl your way into uh, the house, where this would be the floor area, this would be one sleeping platform, another sleeping platform, and then we have penetrating the front wall, we have the kitchen niche. So there was found uh, much bare hair, as the ex excavator said. Um, 
While one interpretation suggests the finding of polar bear hide is expected in a winter house in an area with plenty of polar bear, an alternative explanation aligns with the oral sources. The find of polar bear hair in the lower part of the house corresponds with Inuit practices as an alarm system against approaching unwanted guests or enemies with ill intentions. Uh, these oral sources come both from the Silak on the east coast and from Tule, uh, the Avanasuak, where we are here. This practice um, was both from the north part and the eastern part of Greenland, where we find polar bears um, also coming quite close to some of the human settlements. Another fascinating discovery was made in House 3A, which we find here to the right, but on the left side. In house 3A, Hultville found a curious scraper. That's what he called it. Uh, it was crafted from walrus ivory and adorned with a human head. Additionally, in house 3B that we find uh, closely connected to 3A, an excavated handle with carved animal heads was discovered. While the exact location of these finds were unclear, um, but the carved ivory that was the first one was, quote, inserted between two stones on the north side of the structure. So the first one was found somewhere here. We don't really get a closer description than that. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the find raises questions about its purpose. Could it be an offering for hunting luck, uh, as indicated in some of the oral stories, or possibly remnants of acti a ritual activity? Although the precise significance remains elusive, the carved human head may carry a symbolic interpretation challenging more mundane uh, explanations. Secondly, we explore how the testimonies from the Greenlandic Inuit oral stories offer alternative interpretations at the settlement level. In Alaska, stories of the raven are multiple, showcasing the clever bird's significant role to Alaskan natives. Ancient stories featuring the raven have been registered since the late 1700s. And in one of them, the whale is also featured. In this tale, the raven, whose cry brings uh, daylight, ventures over the sea in search of land, but encounters a whale instead. The raven either flies into the whale or willingly allows its, itself to be swallowed. Once inside the whale, Raven discovers a woman meticulously tending a lamb while seated on a bench. The woman is revealed to be the soul of the whale, and the lamb she, care, she cares for is its heart. The narrative uh, emphasizes the critical role of attending to the lamb, as its uh, extinguishment would plunge the space, in the, the space into total darkness. This story underscores the significance of maintaining the lamp for the Inuit, symbolizing life, much like the whale's life uh, upheld in the narrative and the Inuit's life sustained by the lamp. This narrative may also offer insights into the construction of the Inuit winter house particularly the presence of a small ventilation hole resembling the whale's uh, breathing hole. The connection between the whale uh, and the myth, you know, sorry, between the myth and the house serves as a reminder for the Inuit about the proper way of living. The myth and the house convey the importance of treating life with respect emphasizing the belief in the reincarnation of souls into new bodies and ensuring the continuity of both people and of animals. 
we see the breathing hole, the ventilation hole of the house here. So this is the entrance and the fire would be in here, breathing out here. And of course, this is the breathing hole for the whale. So notably, this specific story does not appear to be recorded in Greenland. Instead, Greenlandic folklore features 151 stories involving a raven and a whale, either together or separately. However, a few of these stories nonetheless bear a striking resemblance to the Alaskan tale of the, ra uh, the raven and the whale. One particular story has been documented in 10 variations across Greenland from 1823 to 1937. The story we see to the left um, is, ID, is from the 1884, and it's the second story uh, in the overview. So it's the story we have here. We have this whole summary of the story to the left. Um, to the left, we see a resume of one of the variations. And in yellow, I have highlighted three material objects mentioned that might play a ritual part in the story. In orange, I have marked the important part that links the relatively mythical story to traditional Inuit whaling, uh, whale hunt, as large game would often be butchered into the appropriate pieces on the beach side. In this narrative, the possessive whale exhibits human-like traits and desires, closely monitoring his uh, young wife and showing arousal when she discards her clothes. The whale's dwelling is depicted with distinctly human features, including a hand, and in some variations, the whale also has an armpit. The story emphasizes the whale's human-like behavior, kidnapping the young woman to a house with features like an entrance tunnel and a sleeping platform, reflecting a human way of living according to Inuit perspectives. A crucial element involves the young woman leading the whale to pursue her and her family in the umiak, which is this large uh, skin boat, eventually leading the whale to their settlement. The narrative explains the whale's uh, demise as it comes ashore and dies, leaving its skeleton in front of the settlement. The intriguing discovery at Nusit, uh, also in the very northern part of uh, Greenland, possibly linking to oral history, revolves around five pairs of sealskin thongs. Excavated from four distinct uh, house ruins, house 10, house 26, house 29, and house 30 at uh, Nuslid, these skin undergarments hold significance due to their potential connections to the old story of uh, the two sisters who play family. That was the variation we saw before with the 10 variations. In this tale, one of the women strategically discard garments, including underpants, with an uh, enticing scent that captivates the whale and dis uh, distracting it during their escape. When we consider the possibility that the seal skin thongs on earth at Nuhlit, um, could, uh, there could be remnants of ritual activities associated with whale hunting. This proposition aligns with the concept of Inuit women symbolically participating in whale hunts. So here we find uh, Ruin 30, which is uh, Qasi. So there is the entrance way, but there is no kitchen niche that we saw before, and there is no sleeping platform uh, along the side. Instead, there are benches, so you are not supposed to sleep or eat inside this structure, um, but you are supposed to uh, either sing or dance or st tell stories inside of this. Uh, so it's an assembly house. 
the intriguing find, uh, one of the examples of the songs we see here, this is just an example. This is not the excavated piece. It would have been lovely, but <laughs> unfortunately they don't look like this. Uh, this is just to give you an example of what they might have looked like. Um, whaling scenes, we find them engraved on uh, architectural elements and evidence suggests the ceremonial distribution and consumption of prized uh, whale hearts. Therefore, interpreting the seal skin thongs as potentially uh, remnants of this whale whaling ceremonialism contributes to a more broader understanding of these practices, emphasizing how oral tradition can unveil connections that might otherwise have been overlooked. Here we see where the whale very likely would have been butchered. So we actually find a whale here that is being cut into pieces. Um, the third and the last example I will cover here is on the landscape level. Initially, it was surprising to discover the spirit, uh, spiritually protective significance attributed to the beach by the Greenlandic Inuit. However, upon closer consideration, this association uh, begins to make perfect sense. Descriptions suggest that the beach may possess an Inua, which is an inherent being itself. And this Inua uh, was accessible to a strong Angakok, which is a local shaman. Uh, or through powerful amulets for seeking assistance against approaching enemies. In one tale, it is recounted that a stranger um, was thrown away from the landing because someone had poured urine on the beach, implying that even an ordinary person, not even an angakok, could use urine in a protective ritual to prevent strangers or foes from approaching the beach, possibly against evil spirits or souls. In some of the other stories we also uh, hear about um, a person with an ill intention coming towards the beach and because the person uh, living on the settlement has performed a ritual on the beach, pouring either blood or urine or reciting a spell, um, the this, uh, ill enemy would be crushed, like the beach would just come and swallow the person, or the beach would become huge mountains that would fall down on the person. <clears throat> so this illustrates the ritual role of the natural feature uh, a function not immediately evident without insight from all tradition. It highlights how indigenous knowledge and storytelling unveil layers of meaning and ritualistic connections woven into the fabric of the natural environment, enriching our understanding of the cultural landscape beyond what archeological evidence alone might reveal. While we as Arctic archeologists typically focus on natural harbors for prehistoric settlements due to their functional use by the Inuit. The oral stories emphasize that certain elements of the natural world uh, were endowed with protective and magical attributes by the Inuit. While archeological methods focus on tangible artifacts and structures, the Inuit narratives offer insight into the intangible aspects of culture, such as rituals, beliefs, and the uh, spiritual significance attributed to the natural features. All histories therefore, therefore provide a cultural context that goes beyond what material artifacts can reveal. And it offers insights into the symbolic meaning, ritual, and spiritual significance associated with certain sites uh, or objects, enriching the understanding of the, the cultural landscape. Moreover, the beach example underscores the interconnectedness of cultural elements encompassing the 
hunting economies stories, the rituals, the natural features and social aspects. This interdependence might not be readily evidenced in the archeological record, thus urging us as archeologists to embrace interdisciplinary approaches, incorporating oral history, anthropology, and other relevant fields. Furthermore, it's crucial to bear in mind that oral stories are inherently tied to subjective interpretations, which means they, might, they may vary among different narrators or different communities. So as archeologists, um, we would find a very natural harbor here on this island in uh, Paluit in the western part of Greenland. And here we find the winter settlements. And archaeologically, we usually find the entrance um, turned towards the natural harbor to the beach because it would be easier uh, to just run out of the house onto the place where your kayak or your umiak is situated, jump into them and get out to the game while they're there. But this one was quite intriguingly turned to the other small harbor on this side. Um, so of course that might confuse us. Um, but there the conclusion might be hidden in the old stories. In the end, the question that remains is, how do these perspectives challenge our current applied field methods? How do we adapt to incorporate the perspectives the oral histories provide? What new questions should we ask ourselves next time we excavate a winter house? And how do we model our next reconnaissance in to incorporate what might have been sacred spaces? These challenges are not various, but opportunities for growth and innovation in our field. By embracing diverse perspectives and rethinking our methods, we not only enrich our understanding of the past, uh, but we also pave the way for more inclusive, meaningful research in the future. Together, we have the potential to create a more holistic narrative, one that honors both uh, scientific inquiry and the voices of those whose histories we seek to understand. The next steps we take are not just in excavation and in excavating artifacts, but in deepening our respect for the cultural landscapes that we study. The future of our work is as dynamic and as meaningful and insightful in the questions that we dare to ask. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully you will take some discussion. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering if you have done any, uh, you know, like you were talking about the oral histories from this database, but whether yeah. you've done any um, you know, storytelling with contemporary communities and how those stories have changed and what those communities, you know, think about these interpretations. Yeah, I haven't done any interviews uh, with um, currently living people in Greenland. Um, I would love to also to see what it means if there are still connections in different regions to some of the things that I can see here. Um, because of the colonization, many of the stories have sort of died out because you didn't have people in the community to pass it on, to sort of safeguard it. Um, so today, many of the stories you find uh, will be the children's stories. They have sort of become children's stories. Um, and you don't believe in Sesmab Amna anymore, which is um, 
this deity who's sitting at the bottom of the ocean and you need to respect her and you need to respect the animal. Um, there is a respect connected to the animals that you hunt, definitely. Um, but the sort of belief has not passed on to that sense. Um, but it would be really interesting to, to interview people today of the stories they have in their communities because I sense that it is living on. It's not necessarily those stories that have been uh, recorded here. So it could be really interesting, yeah. Uh, thank you, Asta. Um, I have a very basic question, may maybe naive, considering that I'm neither archaeologist nor folklorist, but I'm also really interested in this database and these stories. You, When you had that slide, it says that they were collected within a range of like 250 years. And maybe you could just elaborate a bit on exactly how were they collected, who collected them, how were they stored, and how did they end up in this database because that seems to be a very interesting textual process involved there. I figure it changed a lot from yeah. the early 18th century until 1980 yeah. or so. Uh, so if you just have a few more details on that, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, well, the first stories uh, around 1735 um, were collected by missionaries, some of the very first missionaries. Um, so Greenland was uh, colonized from 1721 and the son of this missionary, uh, Hans Ill, the son was called Paul Ill, started to collect some of the stories. But in his diary, so he didn't think, oh, I'm going to go out and collect some of these stories so they will remember them. Uh, he wrote in his diary like, today I heard this really strange story about a woman sitting at the bottom of the ocean and she, I mean, she's definitely, she must be the great grandmother of the devil. So, I mean, <laughs> that's not a very good recording of the story to say the least. Um, so we have that and you would need to sort of like, sort of like with an onion, peel off the outer layers before you would get to, so what did this person actually tell him? Because he sort of ridicules this story by saying this is a strange story, like don't believe it, okay? Um, so the next jump we kind of find in uh, 1840s, um, we see that in Germany and in Denmark and Sweden, probably Norway as well, where you want to collect the stories of the nation uh, before they vanish, right? Uh, so we see the brother Grimm, uh, they collect many stories, uh, we see people in Denmark, and also we have uh, Henrik Renk in Greenland. He feels the same vibes. So in 1850, um, he collects uh, some of the stories. Some of the collection have already been made um, prior to, to him doing it, but he makes an uh, advertisement in the newspaper in Greenland saying, if you have any stories, please write them down and send them to me. So people would write the stories down themselves in their Greenlandic dialect and send it to him. And he would alter more or less some of the manuscripts. So the published stories that you would find, uh, he had altered a little bit like, oh, I have three stories coming in. They're more or less the same. So I'm just going to merge them and publish one instead of us being able today to see the differences because that could be really interesting. Um, and then later on, we see the Tula expeditions uh, in 1900 to 1925. Uh, um, around 1907, we see the literary expedition and hear stories in, um, in Greenland and Canada are collected, uh, and later in 1990, um, uh, Knud Rasmussen moves also to the eastern part of Greenland and collects some of the stories there. Um, and he says that he's collecting them more or less from the mouth and putting it onto paper. But 
we also see some alterations of those stories. Um, sometimes we see elements of sort of fairy tales, uh, like there needs to be three daughters. It needs to end well. We can we need to move out the most um, terrible elements mm -hmm. or incest or stuff like that. We we need to take that out because it's not available. It's not good for the European audience who's supposed to read this. So the recordings of these stories, you have to sort of um, look at them with a sort of grain of salt and, and think that this is not necessarily completely true. But when we take off the layers, what is left behind? Does it actually, because when we think about myths, we think about that it's, it's a fiction already, but what if there is some truth hidden in those stories that is actually connected to the landscape? And if we can get those connections back, it might give us a completely different understanding of the landscape that we are recording as archaeologists. Yeah. A little bit related to that point. Oh, I can just speak louder. <laughs> so a little bit related to that point, um, it, you brought up that in the database, there's not so much in the way of, um, like Greenlandic text there, yeah. Um, partially because all this you've been describing this process is sort of washing, yeah. Um, but that there are sort of place names and personal names and different ways that it, you know, titles that sort of thing. And I'm curious, sort of in connection with the sort of present day storytelling that Lucy mentioned, um, is that something that people are sort of excited about now? Is there like I, I don't know what the state of like language use in Greenland mm -hmm. is, <laughs> Greenlandic. Yeah, it's um, Greenlandic. But yeah. it seems like I'm just curious to hear more about that. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think um, some of the stories that exist today, they are fully in Greenland. But I think it could be really interesting if we could publish some of the older manuscripts that were actually in Greenlandic. Um, because later they were published in English or in Danish. And many houses in Denmark have these uh, sort of volumes standing on the side, like, oh, I'm really interested in Greenland. That's lovely, but why don't we have those volumes in Greenland? In Greenlandic, for example, that would have been lovely too. But, or have this database, for example, um, not just with English and Danish text, but also with the Greenlandic. The problem with that is that um, many of the manuscripts were just discarded, uh, thrown away after the rewritings. Um, we would be able to find some of them uh, and publish them and put them into this database. Um, and I think it would be interesting for people to know, oh, these are stories from my area. It's not just the whole heritage of Greenland. Yes, that can be quite fluffy sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's stories that have only been collected in your area, now that we know that all of the sites are represented, mm -hmm. it could be quite nice to know, oh, maybe this is like my great, great grandpa mm -hmm. who told this story. Or in this area, we apparently had to give the fish something, or, you know, like different rituals. And I think in that way, you'd be able to reconnect with your cultural heritage in a different way. Also, for example, if we can uh, rediscover some of the dialects, things that you would say and you would feel proud of quite regionally, um, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Close so connecting to the, la the language. <laughs> I think I saw this here first. Thanks so much for that talk. It was really interesting and I, kind of have a similar question to the folklore question, but from the archeological side, I was kind of wondering what the, like who is excavating these sites? Is there a sort of consultation process with the Inuit? Are there Inuit archeologists digging these? Are they mostly Danish archeologists coming from Denmark? Mm -hmm. What's the sort of history of archeology span here? Um, because I think the intervention you're making is really important, like to connect these um, oral histories and these indig this indigenous knowledge to these places. But I'm just sort of wondering what the status quo is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, in Greenland, um, many decades, uh, it was outsiders who would come to Greenland and excavate. 
Unfortunately, we also have a history of um, polar uh, expeditions coming along the Greenlandic coast and um, getting, uh, what is it called? Provision? No, like food. Uh, yeah, provisions before they would move on and try to find the Northwest Passage, for example. Um, and there people would come on shore and ask the locals, where do you have your graves? And they would drop these graves, for example. Um, so there is unfortunately a long history of expo exploiting the country for its cultural heritage. Um, but in the recent years, uh, in I, I want to say all the time that you have done archeological excavations in the country. Um, you have tried to tell the local communities about what did we find in your backyard or so so also um including the community in those scientific research um the national museum of greenland was established um only a few decades ago and many of the things that were collected on these expeditions the chula expeditions and stuff like that um were sent off to the national museum in denmark uh, but then you have this uh, Utimut project, which was a 20 year long project um, that found out you need to send some of those objects to the National Museum in Greenland so they have something to exhibit and <laughs> they can be closer to their own cultural heritage and see it. Um, so they ended up sending uh, 35,000 objects to Greenland and uh, they can, uh, the Greenlandic uh, National Museum, they can get the objects that are stored right now in the uh, National Museum of Denmark. They can get it back whenever they want. Um, but they also need to have the storage in Greenland and the facilities to, because you have mummies, you have skin clothing, you have so many objects. You need to have storage room, but you also need to have the cooling systems and stuff like that. Um, so right now, I think there's a really good understanding between the two national museums. Um, and you are always allowed to get to the collections in, in Denmark, for example, to study them, to have collaborative work. Um, and a few years ago, uh, they started making these sort of, uh, you need to apply to come to Greenland and do a project. And you need to tell the local communities about what practice do we have here in Greenland? Is it about the, the glacier ice? And, and you need, you find out something about uh, the global warming or something like that. We want to know instead of you just publishing it in science, right? Um, so I think there is a, a close collaboration today, even though the history was quite grim. Yeah. Well, I did have a question, but Here. I think we should probably stop, shouldn't we? It's about, um, okay, well, I'll just ask my question and thank you so much, really a treat. Um, I kind of wanted to go back to your stories mm -hmm. um, and ask you about the bear and that bear hair yeah. as an illustration of a knowledge base, because obviously um, you in your analysis of this and the history of people interacting with the polar bears, mm. you have some deep knowledge. They I don't know if they're in the actual stories, but I'm guessing there's other, there other value stories. systems yeah. floating around yeah. out there that you are aware of. And that's why the bear here is participating in sound like protection mm. of the of that the people in that house, yeah. right? So yeah. where are these other value systems come? Are they from just living in Greenland and everybody knows? polar bear hair protects. I mean, where are you in your own yeah. knowledge gaining that? Because it's clearly more than just that mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. that you're, you, you know, you're using more than the archaeology yeah. and the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, in Greenland, it's, um, and this also, you will be able to see that through the different stories that when you hunt a game and you kill an animal, you need to pay respect to it. For example, when you kill your first seal, you need to give it fresh water in order for 
it to feel that it is invited into your home, just like you would with any other guest. Mm -hmm. And then you will catch the same seal over and over again throughout your whole lifetime. Um, so there is a respect connected to the different animals. And also with, with the polar bear, um, we find harpoon heads, for example, with feet of a uh, polar bear. So you want to tell the polar bear, look, I made this for you uh, so that you will sacrifice yourself for me and my family so we can eat your meat and, and your bones and stuff like that. So you're sort of offering to the bear in the meantime. And what is interesting in, in this case here, if we say there is um, a piece of, uh, well, some polar bear here inside the entrance here, um, is that in the old stories, it's described that um, to, have a, to set up a sort of alarm system, uh, you can either hang a polar bear skin, polar bear teeth, or polar bear claws in your entrance way because that will rattle to tell you that someone is on their way and they have ill intentions, right? So it's sort of like a, yeah, a, a robbery alarm that we have here in the houses um, that the animal, because you paid the respect to it once you killed it, that it will sort of protect you mm -hmm. if you do it right. Um, but it's not something that is done today in Greenland. You don't have different, like you have a, a, the claw of the polar bear hanging around your, your neck if you have caught it yourself. Uh, but otherwise we don't have alarm systems like that. So that is sort of a lost knowledge uh, that could be revived if people want to do well, But it sounds like it's not lost knowledge, it's just lost enactment. Yeah, yeah. Which is slightly different. You know about it, but you're not yeah. necessarily offering to the grandmother in the water. Yeah, you're yeah. not necessarily putting bear claws up in your house, but yeah. But people are aware of yeah, it. And that's sort something. of this value yeah. system that's still it, it's still present. It's just maybe not enacted. Is yeah. that is that what you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Okay, well, it is after one, so I will thank you all for coming and I uh, hope you enjoyed this and thank you very much for your presentation, rich presentation. We'll see you all next Wednesday, hopefully. So have a good day.